a barbecue hero with delicious, ultra-low net-carb hero bread, buns, and tortillas. Soft and fluffy, high in fiber, and with zero grams of sugar, up to 10 grams of protein, coming in at under 100 calories per serving. Oh, and did I mention they taste like their mouth-watering traditional versions? I mean, what's not to love? Use code AH10 for 10% off your first Hero Bread purchase at Hero.co. That's AH10 for 10% off at Hero.co. Hello, I'm Wendy, and this is Wendy's Coffee House. We're going to talk about dreams. Everybody has them. And what do you do with them? How do you interpret them? What do the symbols mean? Rad Owl's Crash Course in Dream Interpretation might be a good start. J.M. DeBoard is the author. When you teach about dream symbols, it's one of the, the hardest variables is the way that symbols are so personal to the dreamer. Jim DeBoard is an author, editor, audiobook producer. There's a list that I could go on and on and on. You can find him, Radal, on Reddit as the dream interpreter, the dream guru. All right? One of them. The biggest one. The one I know. <laughs> and we're going to get into the dream interpretation dictionary. He has that. But we've done that before. And so it's just going to be like a one-off of there. That's, that's out there. And he's got other issues that he is also following up with beyond dreaming into maybe some precognition and maybe some shamanism. It's time to just kind of unleash your creative element and flow. Hi there. How are you doing? Hi, Wendy. I like that word flow. Uh, When you're in the flow state, things come to you more easily. You don't have to struggle. And you know, when you're in a lucid dream, how you, you feel like you're in the flow and you're connected to everything around you. So I love the introduction because this is getting us into an area of dreaming that I have been exploring as, you know, somebody who researches dreams and studies them and writes books about them. And I teach people traditional ways of interpreting dreams. And I recently discovered that there's this whole other side to it, personally discovered it, not just read about it in a book. And it's fascinating. And I know that your audience is into these same things. So I'm ready to, uh, I'm ready to dig in. Well, first of all, we were going to get into the Rad Owls Crash Course in Dream Interpretation, and this is absolutely slam dunk if you have even done your own dreams. This is still going to be relevant because I think you bring new aspects, and it's a very finely tuned and concise approach to interpreting your dreams. I love the way you've set it out. So let's just go ahead and give the backstory on that because when people are listening, they may want to go ahead and take a course, so we'll set that up for right off the bat. This is what you get into. Yeah, thank you. Um, I I was happy to share that book with you and with everyone because it's 100 pages of the condensed version of 30 years of my personal experience and learning. And I encountered this, you know, a lot of people would ask me, hey, how do you interpret dreams? You seem to have a knack for this. And I would, I would be like, well, you can go at it this way. You can go at it that way. You can be Freudian. You can be Jungian. You can shuck all that and just look at it as a story and kind of analyze the language and use. So there's metaphors in the dream, yada, 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 yada. And then I'm seeing blank stares. And I said, okay, I have to organize this material somehow. And it came to me that there are you can work with dreams in steps of three or chunks of three. So I start off with three simple facts about dreams. For somebody who doesn't really know a lot about, you know, the the study and interpretation of dreams, you want to give them a place to start. Mm -hmm. So I said, well, look, here's a simple fact about dreams. You already know what they mean. And you know what they mean because you create your dreams. Now it means you understand subconsciously what they mean, but it's within your capability to grasp it because the meaning is in your own mind. You created it. It means also that you created an experience for yourself through the dream. So this provides a foundation for people to walk into the process. And then I give them three steps to look at the dream as a story that's told using symbolism. And everything comes together as this big picture. You can look at the little pieces of the picture. And then the big one emerges out of it. And you go, aha. I get it now. I understand what the dream means. I understand what I'm trying to tell myself through my dream. So it's very empowering for people. And I call it a crash course because it's only 100 pages. In three hours or so, however long it takes you to read it, you can start, you can go from zero to waking up tomorrow with at least a process to get you into your dreams instead of like I found with most people is they have no idea where to begin. 
So thank you for your summary of my book. That's what I really tried to get across. That was my goal. And so with your feedback, it tells me that I accomplished my goal. You give instructions on how to tell whether it's accurate. And that helps too, because again, each of us have our own symbols, our own interpretation, our own language, depending on what part of the world you live in, how you interpret a symbol, a fox is a fox is a fox. All right. And that makes it complicated. But if you understand how it applies in your life, then you don't have to take the book that applies to somebody who's living in Bolivia or somebody in Australia. It becomes a personal message and could even be from a past life. When you teach about dream symbols, it's one of the the hardest variables is the way that symbols are so personal to the dreamer. There are commonalities. You know, you could say, well, a fox is, they're known for being sneaky. You know, so there's, you know, there's that aspect of their behavior that can be brought in to a dream as to express an idea. There's something related to the idea of sneaky, but that's one of a hundred possibilities. There's also foxy, guys in like attractive, seductive, you know. Um, but then there's also, you know, maybe when you were a kid, you got bit by a fox. Or maybe in your culture, there are metaphors, you know, figures of speech that use foxes. And so that's what's being brought into your dream as the underlying basis of the symbol. So I can't teach people, even though I wrote a dream dictionary, I can't teach people what all those possibilities are. What I focus on is teaching them how to figure it out for themselves. And once you get the basic ideas down, I tell you, Wendy, you can run with it. You you go, oh, wow, this is a metaphor in my dream. I can understand it now. That's why the fox was burrowing under my house, because there's some kind of sneaky behavior that's outside of my awareness. And it's, you know, you, you understand now what the action of the fox means in the context, and you understand what it means personally to you. And that's the most important part about interpreting dreams. Because you can have someone come to you. You can go to a dream interpreter and say, hey, help me interpret my dream. Well, that's a one-off thing. What do you do with the next dream? Go back to the dream interpreter? Well, hey, I, I charge 90 bucks an hour. Keep coming back to me. I'm happy to do it, you know. But what I'd rather do is teach you how to do it. So there comes a point when you can say, I understand this now, and I can, under, I can interpret my own dreams. So that's the goal for me as a teacher. I like the fact that you're also evolving and getting into more of the animal uh, element. For one thing, that fox, going back to that, if you take it to a shamanic level, it can also be a symbol of the in-between. Fox goes in-between. When my stepfather was dying, I went to visit him as he was within a few days of dying. Outside his house, there was a fox, a beautiful, beautiful red fox, and that was symbolic of the transition and going into that next phase of his being, um, to see the fox that was perfectly on time. But those kinds of things are real-time happenings, and then they can follow you into the dream plane. So if there had been a premonition about the fox being present for me, that would have meant it was in sync with what was happening with my stepfather. So with that, you know, that's the shamanic element. And so these animals have very different meanings when you start getting into learning and applying that aspect to the dream plane. And that's where I have been going because I have been encountering evidence that shows that there is an entirely other area of dreaming to understand other than a traditional dream interpretation and analysis of which I'm, you know, most familiar. And it started off with experiences like I went to see a shaman to, uh, and we did a, a ritual involving a murder of crows And so a murder is like, you know, a gaggle, a group of crows, right? Mm -hmm. We walk out of his house and Wendy, there were crows everywhere. And he just starts laughing because he's seeing the look on my face. Like, are you seeing this? You know, like, and he's like, yeah, I see it. It happens to me all the time. Well, he's a shaman. He's connected him with nature. And what starts happening is, is you start noticing that nature responds to the things that are happening to you internally. Yes. And and, 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 when, and of course, a dream is an internal experience. So you start seeing the ways that the outer world is responding through nature, and nature is spontaneous. There's no, you know, there's, there's no like uh, forethought or agenda or rationality. It's coming from a, a, some other place, call it an intuitive place where the animal knows where you're at, and it shows up at the right place at the right time to 
it's, it's part of a message and it's speaking to you through symbols. The world speaks to you through these symbols in the same way that your dreaming mind speaks to you. And this is what's really fascinating to me because I now know that this is real. I, you, I, I didn't know it before until the world showed me that it's real. And we had a recent episode on, I'm the host of a podcast, The Dreams That Shape Us. And there was a guy named Matt Cochran who was our guest. And he shared a story of having a dream where he connected with an antelope. And when he looked into the eyes of the animal, it was like the eyes are the windows to the soul. He felt like there was this awesome connection between him and the antelope in his dream. So he went out into the woods with a drum and he thought to himself, maybe, maybe there's a response, maybe nature, something larger speaking to me than just that is contained within the dream space. And he sat there for half an hour, beat his drum, nothing happened. He thought, well, you know, maybe not. Well, guess what? He gets up, starts to walk away, and 20 feet away is the same pronghorn antelope that he saw in his dream. And it continued to happen after that. He had more encounters with antelope. So it was like it showed up. It started in his dream, and then the dream continued into the waking world. And this is what the shamans say that to me, before I understood, until I experienced it personally, it was just kind of an abstract idea. Oh, the waking world is an extension of the dream world, and the dream world is an extension of the waking world. They're parallel realities. That maybe call it ends of a spectrum, but a spectrum is one thing. And I would look at it and be like, oh, yeah, you know, merrily, 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 life is but a dream, right? You know, it's a metaphor. Well, guess what? There's a reality to it because I've seen it happen and I've seen the responses from my internal world that, that the external world responds to it and sometimes validates it and says, yes, what you're experiencing is real. And it's what the shamans know and have known for thousands of years. But most people who are brought up in an empirical, rational, you know, I have a college degree. I've studied the philosophy of science. I was a rationalist it's very easy to discount this stuff because you say, oh, there isn't any evidence for it. Well, when you experience it for yourself, you find out it really is. If it's not there, then you haven't been paying attention. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Or you're deliberately discounting it. You have a blind spot to it. There are people who don't want to know that reality is a greater thing than what they have been taught to believe mm -hmm. and what they've experienced for themselves. You know, you want to, uh, everything follows Newton's laws and, and Einstein's relativity. And we can understand everything that there is through, you know, empiricism and rationality. And there is a rational side to it. I think that we as rational beings are made the way that we are for a reason. Nature designed it for a reason. There's something that it's doing for consciousness where we need to be rational and logical, but at the same time, we also need to be open to intuition and feelings and wacky, wild coincidences that you realize are synchronicities, which starts to happen as you get into dream work. You'll wonder like, well, did I understand that dream correctly? You know, like, or am I on the right path? It's not necessarily the individual dream. It's what you're taking away from the work that you're doing getting up in the morning, focusing on your dreams first, doing other practices to help to enhance your, your relationship with your dreams. And what you start to see happen are synchronicities that line up with your dream world. Like with Matt's case, when he saw a pronghorn antelope, he said, yes, this is, I, un I understood my dream correctly and I followed up on it correctly. I, I took action on it correctly. Oh, not correct as in right or wrong, but just he understood what the real message was there for him. And Wendy, what it meant for him, he ended up having an experience. His father had committed suicide, and he was holding all that grief in himself. And through the experience with the antelope, he was able to drain that grief. And he said it was an incredibly emotional experience. And now do you know what he does? He teaches people about how to find their own call of the wild. In other words, his experience is turning him into a shaman yeah. Yeah. And, and a dream worker. It's taking him further. It's taking him onto a path in life that he didn't know was there before. It opened up. The antelope greeted him on the path and said, follow me. And he, 
And now he's off and going and yes. he has found enrichment and fulfillment in his life in a way that he wouldn't have found otherwise. I'm going to give you a dream. Now, this is because you are going in this direction. And it's also a part of the thing that as you evolve, you may interpret it differently. But I'm going to throw it out. And then maybe later on down the line, after you've done more of your shamanic work, you can come back and see how this applies. I have a dream. I'm standing at the door of the house. My husband has a cicada. And he... Uh, he releases it over to me and I don't want it to get on my clothes because I don't want to distract it. I don't want to um, interfere with its flying. Well, instead, because I move, it flies into the house and I'm like, Oh no, 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 no. The cats, the dogs, I don't want, I don't want anybody to hurt it. So I'm following the cicada into the house at the same time as I watch it go by, I see as it's flying, it's just absolutely beautiful. And it's almost like I have 3D and enhanced vision as I'm watching it fly maybe eight inches in front of my right at eye level and thinking how gorgeous it is and hoping that I'm going to be able to catch it and move it outside quickly <laughs> without any interference from anybody else. But at the same time, um, just appreciating the beauty of this, this incredible bug insect being. And that's where it ends. Wow. You know, the first thing that came to mind for me, and this is from my training, it's habit, is I start thinking about the possibilities for symbolism. And, of course, cicadas are rare creatures. You didn't say a cricket, you know. You didn't say a locust because they're creatures that look a little bit like cicadas. Yeah. You know, you said it's a cicada. And I'm going, you know, just last summer, they had their every 17 years, they come out of the ground. They have this incredible time of fertility and activity. Yes. And then they disappear again for 17 years. So that was the first idea that came to me is there's something here that's rare and precious. And it seems to want to come into your life. But I also wonder, why would you, is it really, is it really necessary to keep it out of your house? Because if the house is your being, as it often is in traditional dream interpretation, you think of the inside of the house as being the inside of you, your inner life, your inner being. So does the cicada actually maybe belong in there? If but I there could, was a reason yeah, why yeah. you reacted the way you did with your cats, which sometimes this sort of rational programming overlays with the dream. Yes. I mean, I might think the same thing. We rescue bugs out of my house all the time because I have two bug hunters in my house, two cats <laughs> who, yeah. you know, good, good luck with that, you know, because when they're on the hunt, man, those, those crickets and stuff and spiders and, you know, lizards. Yeah, they don't stand a chance. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's that rational overlay with the dream, but then there's also something where I would wonder if it's maybe like the hummingbird, like something that comes from the upper realm, you know, from spirits or from high up in an inspired sort of thought and feeling that is now coming down into this level to deliver you a message. I, and of I course, it might be something that evolves over time. Do you know what that message is or is there something, is it kind of to be continued? It's something I'm working with. It has to do with that length of time having, you know, been hatching and working and putting it together for a long period of time before bringing it out. And the fact that that was my rational response, it had nothing to do with what was going to happen. It had to do with that's the linear plane saying, oh, it's going to be in danger. I need to release it. But the fact that it came and just hovered and I was watching 3D and just seeing it and seeing how beautiful it was. And my husband, the presence, is giving me the freedom. Okay, he really he sends it over to me, and I'm like, oh, I don't want to hurt it. I don't want to get stuck on my clothes. Oh, you know? And so he, yeah. with that, he's, he appreciates it. He's not hurting it. He's sending it to me. Like, here, look, this is so cool. And then I, I see it, and I'm like, wow. It is just, a, and because it kind of goes slow-mo, and there I see it up close and personal as it flies by. So I, you know, that part is how I interpret. But I also see, you know, when you're bringing it to my attention again, that yes, the linear goes right there in into that same plane of the intuitive. And my gut was that it was about the message of the being, the animal, and not what my response was. Are you working with fairies, Wendy? Because as I picture that cicada hovering right in front of you, I sure see a picture of Tinkerbell in my mind. <laughs> They're here whether I acknowledge them or not, yes. They, they, uh, they manage to give me tomatoes every year whether I plant them or not. The flowers, they brought elderberries. I would 
we wanted elderberries in the yard and had been here for maybe six or seven years and really focused on wanting elderberries. And all of a sudden, now we have more elderberries, than, more than we can possibly deal with. You brought up something that I want to share with your audience and share with you is that oftentimes in the dream space, when there are when there's something new that you're encountering, your dream will refer to what you what you are familiar with and already know to be a symbol for it. This is the basic nature of symbols. Dreams take what you know to help you to understand what you don't know. Check out Rad Owl's Crash Course in Dream Interpretation, jmdeboard.com, Wendy's Coffee House. Major phone carriers make you sign contracts with rigid data plans to trap you into a kind of forced phonogamy. Sounds pretty insecure if you ask me. At Consumer Cellular, we believe in a more consensual and healthy form of phonogamy, free of contracts and more flexible to your data needs. This way, you stick around not because we force you to with contracts and fees, but because you love our phone plans. Like ardently love our phone plans. Phonogamously. Consumer Cellular. When Freedom calls, we're here to answer. Call us at 1-888-FREEDOM. Wendy's Coffee House, my guest, J.M. DeBoard, talking about dreams. Check out Rad Owl's Crash Course in Dream Interpretation, jmdeboard.com. And now back to the dream. We were talking about the dream I had about the cicada. What about the symbol? So behind the symbol, a cicada, and it's not just any cicada, it's this you know, beautiful creature and you get it to see it really up close. And I'm, I'm picturing sort of iridescence, you know, because when you look at the underside of their wings and stuff, they have those cool iridescent colors and stuff to them. And so what I'm picturing is that if it was a fairy that was entering into your dream space, your dreaming mind would need to render it as an, as a symbolic image. So it pulls from your memory. It says, what's the closest thing in my memory that I have to a cicada? Or, sorry, or to a fairy, and it would be something like a cicada. So this is an insight that helps people to understand what's going on in their dreams. What's really behind the symbol? Why did the dreaming mind choose that symbol as a messenger? And it's because it's pulling from your memory to find something that's the closest approximation of whatever it is that you're actually encountering in the dream space. When I deal with fairies, and I'll tell you, <laughs> I wasn't prepared when I heard them singing. I was in the yard gardening, and then I heard the little voices, Mother, bring the rain that we might drink. It was, it was a, a chant and a song, and the clouds came over. We had a few sprinkles, and it was over. That was a moment that opened me up to realize in my adult life yeah. I was still connected to the fairies I was connected to as a child. And then here in this place where, it's so, um, where they're so prolifically letting me know that they're here, uh, the the first one I got had a flower around her face, and it was a purple flower, very white skin, dark. You know, um, the, the, it was just an amazing. And her name was Viola Violet. So that and uh-huh. my, my violets do great. So you know, these kinds of things for me are are also literal. It isn't just a metaphor. That that um, element I have had connections with this insect. The timing, the fact that they are 23, 17, and uh, there's another uh, eight years, I think, for their their time span. Um, I think it has to do, again, with something where you are working on it for a period of time before you bring it out. And Uh, that's part of it, making sure it's a safe space and that I'm ready. I wish more people would, when you open your mind to these things, and when you ask, we say, wow, is there this other side to reality that I can find it outside of my, you know, my technology and my, you know, the buildings and society and the world that we've constructed that's, you know, it's, it's, it's self-contained. You open your mind and just ask, is there a larger world out there uh, that's more alive than what I can see with my normal eyes? And I have found that it, it might take some work. But if you do, if you, if you do the work, you take the steps, you work with your dreams, you meditate, you pray, uh, you don't have to do all of the above, but have a practice that you do for yourself that helps to connect you in first to your own body and through your body to the environment that you'll start having these experiences. And I wish more people would understand that this magic is available to them. We need it right now in this world. And I think that it's the tonic that people are missing because when they go out in the nature and they have these experiences, suddenly all those things that were problems before that were stressing them out, it all goes away. Yeah. 
because nature's now responded to you in a way that's very magical. I, I hope that your listeners out there who maybe are experiencing that or are curious about it will know that I started off very much as a, you know, traditional dream interpreter, studied Carl Jung and read all the Sigmund Freud and Alfred Adler and all their contemporaries. And I went through all the traditional sort of dream interpretation. I'm a member of the Association for Study of Dreams, which means there's a lot of academic people who they're neuroscientists and, and sleep medicine specialists and stuff like that. They're very much locked into this way of viewing things through the empirical lens and it wasn't easy for me to let go of that and open up to these other possibilities. But once I did, and in a way I was kind of brought into it kicking and screaming, but I did, <laughs> I said, okay, let's see what else is out there. And it did, it did respond to me. And now it's going further with kind of connecting with my animals, listening to your show and listening to the animal communicators. I started looking at my cats going, Okay, let's uh, let's see what I can pick up off of you. You know, mm -hmm. like you, you start practicing with it and playing with it. Play is a good word for this because, you know, it doesn't have to be this heavy, serious thing. You can just play with it and open up to the possibilities. Taking a walk the other day, I heard the trees talking. I heard it. Mm -hmm. I said I heard it. I felt it, but it was then rendered in my own mind as sort of a language, more like a song but I could hear it. And I'm like, the whole thing is alive and aware. Yeah. It all is. And this is what the shamans have been saying. But then you get the argument like, well, here, I'm going to pick up this rock. Is it alive? No. Hey, you know, McFly. And they start beating on the rock. Say something, McFly. You know, and, and it's like they're, they want to say, well, just be, this is dead matter. It doesn't have any life to it. It doesn't have any consciousness. So your whole theory about everything being alive, that's all a bunch of bunk. And you go, well, you know, I understand why you're coming at things from that perspective. I used to think that way, but I'm realizing now that life is so much more than just human life. That everything is alive because there's one consciousness behind it all that created it all. And not just this universe, but them all. Gary Wimmer on your show. I just went back and listened to that episode the oh, other yeah. day. Yeah. Because his his NDE experience and what it did to him to make him realize the whole universe, there was a mind behind it of infinite love and infinite creativity. And it's created this playground for us. And it, it's just up to us to open our minds to the ways that it responds to us and the way that it's alive and aware of us. So when I look at the butterflies, you mentioned the monarchs. Yeah. You know, we had a very fertile summer here. We had a lot of monsoon rain here in Tucson, Arizona, and everything, the landscape came alive in ways that I've never seen. That sustained rain for like six weeks, really, that desert just opened up. And suddenly we had the moths and the butterflies, and there were more creatures than I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. And we in our, you know, in our home, you know, no pesticides good vibes mm -hmm. outside singing and stuff like that. And it just seemed to, maybe they were there anyway and they would have been there, but I tell you, Wendy, they, whoo, they, they <laughs> came to our little acre out here in the foothills, you know, uh -huh. like <laughs> they were, <laughs> and they responded. And so this is what I've been discovering is that there's, there are layers to this reality and you can find them through your dreams and you can access them experience them and then the same places where you are when you're awake they're they're kind of on a different frequency but it's it's all a, it's all a spectrum so you might wake up and now you're tuned into a different frequency but guess what that other frequency that you were in when you were dreaming it is still broadcasting mm -hmm. and this is something that Carl Jung said that I didn't I really understand until I experienced it he said that the dreaming function of the mind is always on. When you wake up, your conscious mind is now preoccupying you and your sensory input is preoccupying you. But in the background of your mind, you are still dreaming. And I found that, I've, I found that to be true. That you can actually, in your waking state, you can access into the dream state that's going on in the background of your mind. 
And that's when the two realities can come together in a way in your own conscious experience of it. And now you're not just operating on one frequency. Baby, we are now multi-band. You know, like we can handle a lot more frequency and process a lot more information and be much more expansive as a conscious being, which is what I think that ultimately the goal is. And it's one of the reasons why you want to work with your dreams, because it will open you up to become a more conscious, more aware, more expansive human being. You become more aware of what's a precognitive dream. You had a connection with Julia Mossbridge, and she's the one who's doing the precog experiments. What were you able to connect with with her? She was asking me about, as my experience as a moderator at Reddit, um, the what are when people report having precognitive dreams, how do they react to it? What are the questions that they have? And the first one is, is it real? because they, they want to write it off as being a coincidence. Mm-hmm. And then it's, is there something that I have to do in response? Because they've, dre- they've had an experience of dreaming about something that in the future came true. And sometimes what they dreamed about is disturbing to them. Yeah. Um, sometimes it involves people who are close to them, you know, loved ones. Sometimes it's people they haven't seen in years, you know, and they have a, a dream that their high school, somebody they knew in high school is going to get sick. And then it happens in exactly the way or close to the way that they dreamed about it. So they think that there's a responsibility that they have to respond to what they were dreaming. And it's, that's not always the case. It doesn't always mean, hey, I got to go and get in touch with this person because I had a dream that they got sick. Or in the case, one guy had a dream about Kobe Bryant dying on a mountainside in a helicopter crash. And, and then within a week, it happened. And he was like, should I, you know, is this something, should I have tried to get in touch with him to save him? And I was like, you you would, you know, that's what crazy fans do. Mm -hmm. You know, like it's not your responsibility to do it. So Julia, um, the neuroscientist who studied, you know, precognition and is one of a growing number of people in who are very rational scientific based who know that it's real, who know that it's been proven through experimental science. Um, Julia is one of these people who are really digging into it, who've gotten past the question of, is it real? And they're, and they're now asking questions like, how does it work? And how does it affect the individual? For me, precognition was the wedge that opened up my mind to get out of that strictly sort of rationalist traditional way of understanding dreams because when I encountered precognition and then I went and found the evidence from the scientists who studied it, I said, well, okay, this is real. This has been proven. I have experienced it many times. So if there is this aspect to dreaming that is on the wild side, let's Mm -hmm. say, you know, definitely outside the standard paradigm, what else have I heard about dreams that I kind of, you know, pushed away because I couldn't wrap my mind around it. I couldn't accept it as being real. What else could be real? So precognition was the wedge that opened the door. And then I started having like visitation dreams, you know, Mm -hmm. traditional dream interpretation. You talk to people who are in this field and you will find two very distinct camps. They're the ones who say, oh yes, visitation dreams are real. And there's others who say, it's wishful thinking. Mm. It's just an ordinary dream that's being interpreted as a visitation. Well, I went out and discovered that it is actually real. And so now I've got precognition and visitation. And then I had shared dreams. I had a shaman I worked with who told me we can meet in a dream. And I said, huh, okay, well, this is a heck of an opportunity. Let's, let's try this. Yeah. I didn't remember any of my dreams from that night. He remembered three distinct dreams with someone that looked a lot like me in them. Not exactly, but close enough that he knew it was me. He knew it more by my energy and my voice. And they were the three dreams that he had. The center or the central idea of them were three things that I was thinking about before I went to bed, including Wendy. He said he had one dream that was everything was yellow. Everything was the color yellow. Guess what chakra I was working with before I went to bed and connecting my mind with it, or at least <laughs> the mind's already connected, but third chakra, you know, the yellow is to the, the color. And it was, I said, if I, in this dream space, I need to be able to bring my willpower into this space. 
mm-hmm. because I'm often kind of passive in the dream space and I wanted to bring more willpower into it. So I was activating that solar plexus. I could feel it light up with energy. And at that moment or sometime thereafter, he's dreaming and he's picking up on it and his entire dreamscape is yellow. Mm -hmm. And there were two other things that happened that were way too odd, way too specific for me to be able to say, "Eh, it was probably coincidence. So once you start having these, you know, you start with precognition and I tell you the door opens and, you know, I don't want to use Pandora's box as a metaphor, but the box opens and all kinds of interesting things start popping out. And that's for, that's been my evolution from the traditional side of dreaming into the shamanic side of it. It's been fascinating. So it's basically what happened was you gave yourself permission and said, okay, I'm going to broadcast and I'm going to broadcast on this wavelength. And he's going, yo, yellow. (laughs) Yeah. Welcome. I've been waiting for you. Where you been? You know? (laughs) Yes. And that permission, there's, that's a good word, Wendy, when I, I've, I phrased it a little differently earlier, but it's once you open your mind to this and you say, I would like to know for myself, you're giving yourself permission. And then the world, these other, and these deeper layers start responding to you because they're aware of you, whether you're aware of them. Yes. And they will have, they will let you have your very limited existence if you want to be a debunker you want to be an empiricist well that has its place and but it it becomes it's something if you want to limit yourself that way then you're not there there it's not going to pry you open unless there's a really good reason for it like a soul purpose in life past life you arranged it to be pried open so that you can experience these things but otherwise you have to give yourself permission for it. Yeah. And once you do that, then you'll very quickly find, or maybe not so quickly. Sometimes it's an evolution. Sometimes it takes years. But if you keep at it, you'll find that there, there is a reality to this stuff that you can experience personally. And it opens up your world and your conception of life in a way that is, um, uh, it, it's mind-blowing. So, yeah, people, try it. <laughs> it, 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 give yourself permission and it and it will start to happen and i gear and, and i promise you that you can remain the rational fully functional day-to-day living go to job take care of your family keep the roof over your head you can still be that person too while having the other experience of the greater and this was something that i'm inspired by by carl jung too because he went through this as a psychiatrist, as a doctor, as a prominent member of his community who started in his mid-30s having experiences that blew the doors off of rationality. And after he went through all of that and he was able to reflect on it in his autobiography, he said that the unconscious mind that is part of this uh, big driving force behind these experiences that also creates your dreams, by the way, needed me to be the rational you know, the trained yes. scientist yeah. who was going to speak the language of science to understand this other world and then find the language of science so that I can share this knowledge with other people. And when he op- he pried open that door and there have been a lot of people who it gave them permission to go there because they looked at Dr. Jung and said, such a prominent scientific medically established person says that he experienced these things when they were real and he could stay sane while doing it. That means I can do it too. For anyone who is interested in your course, it's Rad Owl's Crash Course in Dream Interpretation, J.M. DeBoard. And the website, your personal website, jmdeboard.com, Rad Owl, available as a dream interpretator, interpreter. <laughs> <laughs> interpreter. Yeah, I, I like it. <laughs> interpreter. You. Um, uh, yeah. Uh-huh, yeah. Uh, I just go my own way, and that's on Reddit. So you can you can get a, a dream interpreter. <laughs> it almost sounds like a food. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> a side Potato. dish. Yeah. Well, I yeah, I've been the moderator there for ten years of the Dream subreddit. So it's dreams.reddit.com. It's the largest online home for sharing uh, dreams. And it's an open global community. And um, yeah, it's my baby. I've been doing it for 10 years now. And um, people can come there to share their dreams. 
you can sometimes, hey, you might, I might be able to see your dream and pop in and give my feedback on it. And if you want to do more direct work, you have Radal's Crash Course in Dream Interpretation. I highly recommend that. There's dreamschool.net where I have all my video recorded, you know, online classes. Um, and um, your podcast. Um, there are other resources. Yeah, the podcast, um, the dreams that shape us. We have got some fantastic stories of people who have had these powerful dreams that shape their lives. My co-host, Stephen Ernenwein, uh, he creates custom music for it. And we get into these in-depth interviews with the people who have these experiences. It's been eye-opening for all of us. But I have now encountered so many people who've had like Matt's experience with the antelope that it's undeniable now. Yeah. Individually, you might be able to say, well, maybe they misinterpreted their experience. But guess what? There's a body of evidence that's overwhelmingly big and huge. And Wendy, can I mention Jeff Mishlove? You yeah. know about how oh, he yes. won the Bigelow Prize, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. He uh, half half million dollar prize for his essay um, trying to prove the existence of the afterlife. And it's, it's all there in black and white. This is a paradigm changer and it comes from a prominent voice in the field. So if I throw that out there too, people, I, this is, this this has happened. You know, the UFO landed on the white house lawn and now we've proven the existence of the afterlife, or at least there's a blueprint that we can now follow and we will prove this. It's beyond just, any doubt, and yes. it will change life as we know it. Thank you. We'll, we'll connect again after you've done more of your shamanic work to see how that progresses, because I think you're going to have a whole lot of fun. There's a lot coming up, and you picked up on it in your dream that we discussed before going on the air. That was, yeah, that's, that's definitely where I'm going. So thank you for that. I will look forward to uh, giving a progress report the next time we talk. J.M. DeBoard, Rad Owl's Crash Course in Dream Interpretation. I'll put some links on my blogs, wendyscoffeehouse.com, and other blog, talkingtonightlights.com. I tend to write more about my personal stuff on Talking to Nightlights, and you can find more information here in the outline of today's show. Thanks for listening. Sweet dreams.